It can be really important to, to not neglect the old fashioned methods, um, you know, getting out there at industry events, getting out there at conferences, getting to know people um, as well as, and this might be a bit more controversial, but cold calling um, done in the right way, allowing people that time to know, go, no, actually, I can't talk right now. I'm going to hang up. Um, it is still is still a really valuable tool it's a way of breaking through the noise and I think a lot of people are, are either scared to do it or just not used to doing it anymore and so um, you know if, if you employ a few different methods including the the more old-fashioned ones um, you you'll I guess like anything in life if, if you're more diverse in your approach you'll get a more diverse set of results. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the recruiting revolution uh, our guest today is emily scahill from united kingdom uh, with over nine years of extensive experience in hr and recruitment uh, emily is the head of client success at skill uh, so skill uh, has been a global leader in recruiting for the games and interactive industries for more than 30 years uh, welcome to the podcast emily excited to have you here thanks very much for having me i'm really excited to be here Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, to start off, uh, can you tell us more about your journey so far in the industry? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as you said, I, I've worked in HR for a, for a long time um, in higher education. Uh, it was a charity, uh, essentially, so not a lot of money, um, but we were always looking to develop new talent. Um, so there was a lot of hiring of students as they moved through university and left, as well as managers um, who were experienced enough to, to sort of impart their knowledge towards them and trustees. Um, and the thing about working in, in the charity sector is you don't have a lot of money, so you have to get really creative with how you advertise and and find new talent and, and reach out and approach approach talent and really think about them and what they might be looking for and the places they might be where you might find them. Um, and I, I kind of had this, this fascination with recruitment and how you can get really, really good at it um, at the same time as, as doing all the other parts of, of HR. And then uh, I discovered that there was a, a game specialist talent agency um, uh, in my hometown. Um, and I snapped, snapped up the chance to, to work with them because uh, uh, gaming has been a passion of mine ever since, since I was little. So um, it was nice to be able to focus so, solely on recruitment and try and get really, you know, make sure I'm, I'm doing that to the best of my ability whilst joining that with, a, with an industry I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, and hopefully my kind of, wider knowledge of, of the candidate experience and um, employer branding and, and all the things that I had to get really good at in my last job, I'm able to sort of translate for our clients and um, sort of su support them with their overall talent strategy as, as well as, you know, the, the creative ways we, we find to, to find candidates for the, the roles that they struggle to fill. Got it. That's amazing. You know, you, you told us about uh, the budget constraints that you were having, like you were facing in your earlier uh, career path uh, so you know at that time like what tools were you using to you know recruit talent or like uh, were you using any ATS or like any, any any recruitment software or was it like manually you were doing on the google sheets or excel sheets how was it yes so um if it initially uh it was excel sheets and and when we did our mass student recruitment where we would have three to sort of 500 applications um ultimately everything still ended up downloaded in a spreadsheet because it's sort of the only way you can sort through and, and score that that number of, of candidates um on that mass scale but uh we we ended up using a um a HR system that I helped, uh, I partnered with the company to help design the, the ATS function. Um, they're called uh, Staff Savvy. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that was a, the, the system we ended up adopting. Um, and it allowed us, because they we were able to help design it, it allowed us to build in a lot of features around preventing unconscious bias and things like that. Got it. Um, you know, uh, like, uh... Yeah, like, like, would you like think like, you know, AI has transformed a lot, uh, you know, uh, back then when recruitment was really different. So like, what changes have you seen so far in recruitment altogether? So, um, 
I think it, it's th there's a few things, right? I mean, you have ATS systems now that automatically pass resumes and cover letters and um, assign tags to different ones and create recommendations, you know, or one to five stars for different candidates, which can all be really useful for helping with the filtering. Um, but I think, you know, uh, AI is still very much at that stage where it still needs a, a human to, to double check and make sure that it's interpreting the data correctly. Um, so it can be time saving, but I, I think, you know, it, alongside that, it's important to educate those using those tools around how to use them. And at the same time, you know, um, we're using AI to be more creative with how we search for, for candidates. So sometimes, um, you know, chat GPT, for example, can come up with a Boolean search for you to use for candidates that you hadn't thought of, and it will pull up a whole new list of candidates that you've you've not yet seen. So I think, you know, there, there's a lot of different creative ways you can use it, as well as, you know, you've got built in tools on LinkedIn now for helping you to draft emails that are effective. Um, but again, it's that case of maybe use that as a starting point, but then you still need to double check, make sure it's not uh, telling any lies, make sure it's all accurate. Um, so I think, you know, at the moment, AI is is very much a tool you can use to to perhaps try a different angle or be more creative or or save time. But it still needs that that human um, expert approach to to ensure it's it's doing its job. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, like you know, uh, like we've seen like in COVID, you know, there there, there were a lot of uh, you know, we, we have seen layoffs. So like, do you think like in the UK market, like recruitment is still a challenge or like where do you uh, see recruitment is like, is has been easier or is it still like a, in a difficult place? Maybe in the tech yes. side, I guess. What's that, sorry? Uh, majorly on the, te uh, the tech side, the technical, uh, you know, hiring side. Yeah, I think I think from what we're hearing, um, recruitment in general is is um, struggling a bit in the UK. Uh, you know, even sectors like construction, which I think traditionally have been quite strong recruitment wise, are, are struggling a bit from from what we're hearing from our colleagues in other sectors. Um, so it, it's definitely facing a challenging time, um, and gaming in particular. A twenty one percent of people have been laid off across Europe, um, and it, it's not isolated to Europe alone you know the same is happening in North America um, and even China and, and countries in the APAC region although you might not hear about it as much um, it's still happening so there have been you know and, and a lot of the the layoffs have been in roles like HR and recruitment and uh, or marketing uh, QA so there's but yet there's still a really high demand for talent for sort of your your less so for mids, but but definitely for your seniors and your leads and your directors. So it's it's this really interesting situation where uh, you know you've got a lot of studios who have much reduced budgets, so they're they're not working with talent partners as often, um, or their own internal recruitment teams have been slashed um and so yeah there's there's less capacity in-house to deal with with applications so sometimes what you get is when they do advertise a job even if it's at a lower level um they get completely inundated with applications because there's so many people out of work and then they've not really got the capacity in-house anymore to deal with all of those so you get a lot of applicants sort of left in the lurch and they never hear back and it's a really tricky time and and you know it, it's my heart goes out to internal TAs as well as candidates I don't think anyone's really winning right now um, hopefully the the situation will will right itself over the next year or so um, but that's where we're trying to you know build really strong relationships with studios so that they know when they are able to use us um, that that we know how they work and we can just sort of um, I guess uh, sync really easily with their team and, and everything's set up and ready to go yeah true uh, so you know uh, like in this situation like still uh, like how do you approach uh, you know, reaching out to candidates or maybe it's not a high volume as such, but how do you approach in th these situations? Because like, companies are not hiring as such. So uh, like, what is your approach for that? 
It really depends. I mean, if we if we're doing a lot of keeping in touch with our network right now to make sure that they know we're here, they can get advice from us on their you know CV and portfolio to give them the best possible chance of success, um, and sort of just building that trust so that when we do have a role for them, they know um, that we understand what it is that they're looking for. So we're doing a, a lot of sort of just keeping in touch with people, even if we've not necessarily got a job for them right now. Um, but when we do have a job for them, I think it's, you know, it's about really asking the right questions and digging deep because ultimately we we want to place people in jobs. That's that's what we're in it for. Um, you know, it, it, pe- people are in really difficult situations often. At the same time, we need to make sure the client, you know, the fee payer is happy and they're getting value for money. So it's making sure that we are. And again, I think this goes into knowing your candidates before you even have a job for them, Um, making sure a candidate really is going to be happy long term or at least for a couple of years at the studio or company that you're sending them to by understanding you know their values their culture uh, what really motivates them at work do they prefer a, a big uh, kind of behemoth of a company um, with lots of rules and processes already in place or do they like working at a startup because there's a lot of those popping up right now and wearing lots of different hats and having lots of ownership um, but also sort of less structure and needing to be more okay with things being uncertain so it's knowing and understanding all those kinds of things so that you know we are placing people in roles that they'll be happy with for for a long period of time rather than as is often the case when you hire direct and a, and a candidate can see your company and, and your your website or your studio, they end up kind of telling you what you what they think you want to hear. Um, and and often, understandably, many of them have been out of work for quite a while. So um, it, it can be really it, it, essentially you've just got to make sure that that it is a role that they're going to be happy in rather than one taking one they're taking because they they don't really have any other choice um and at the same time as well trying to reassure people because games can be quite often um an unstable industry if you know projects end and people are laid off etc um or people move on and teams change and things so you know we've I think uh, a percentage of people over the last sort of year or two have had to take jobs outside of games. Um, so it's trying to hold on to and retain that talent as well. Um, quite often, people are really passionate about the industry, so at least that goes in 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 the fa- in in its favor. Yeah, got it. Uh, also, you know, you 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 mentioned that you you work with different studios and you know, of course, different uh, good companies. Uh, so, like uh, in the gaming of sector, I would say, like, what is the like the hiring process looks like is it like similar to most of the um the you know the computer science area or is it different like the assignments or you know how how, how is the process looks like it really varies um you know some studios will um have a one stage interview and then they'll hire some will have seven stages um some will have a test some won't and it, it varies as well depending on the role um so you know an engineering role or perhaps an art role is more likely to to have a test things are um studios are now thinking about whether or not those tests should be paid or not because it, it, some of these tests are quite long and so if a candidate's putting a lot of time into that and then ultimately they don't get a job at the end it, it may leave them with a sour taste in their mouth and and they may you know not apply to that studio again in future when perhaps they might be more qualified or might sell uh, you know talk to their it's quite a small close-knit industry in some senses they might sort of say to their friends oh you know it's annoying I, I did this test it took a week or it took two weeks and I never I didn't get the job or um and I think in some some respects you know whether it's paid or not paid is is kind of a new it being paid is kind of a new thing but in in the very least um studios need to be giving feedback detailed feedback when someone's put that amount of time into something um just to ensure there is a good candidate experience so i don't know how that really compares to other sectors so much but um it it can vary quite a lot across different studios okay so you uh, you mean paid by in the sense the candidates uh, get like some kind of reward or like how how or, like what's the paid situation 
So yeah, sometimes a studio will pay a candidate, um, I guess, a fixed amount for for doing a, a test, okay. just because of the, the the sheer amount of time that that these things take, or or you know, it, it it's their sort of intellectual property in a way as well, I suppose. So okay. yeah. Okay, I've not heard it. I, I, I don't think uh, it's, it's like a thing in any other, like, you know, skill sets I feel it might be something like there's something new that I'm hearing, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, also like wanted to like, you know, there's this one challenge that, you know, comes up uh, is like when we have a lot of candidates, like, you know, so like when we have a lot, a lot of candidates, the market is like getting the attention and, you know, the talent that you're looking for uh, uh, is, is like it is, is like the quantity is very like large. So how like do the company, you know, gets the name out? Like, for example, like what strategies are companies using to attract like those top talent? Like, you know, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really varies um, depending on the company. I mean, you have some companies um, where the name is really well known already because of the the titles that they've already released. You know, they they kind of have a captive audience in some respect because if people are the people working in the industry are quite often fans of their game. So, you know, you you have your big um, what we call AAA uh, big budget studios um I suppose it's you know in the, in the same way as working in the movie industry it, you'd be hard pushed to find someone that hasn't heard of Disney um it's a similar thing you know it, there, there's uh, the people who made GTA Rockstar they're they're very well known uh for example uh obviously new newer studios or studios that, that perhaps had a, a smaller budget are uh, they have to to be more creative and that's that's where um, you know, they they might uh, employ sort of headhunting resources either in house or by partnering with a talent partner, or um, you know, spending more on paid advertising on LinkedIn, for example, or really getting into those community spaces. You know, there's a lot of um, a lot of sort of community platforms and groups like Discord or um, Women in Games or um, I'm going to get the name wrong, I think, but, um, you know, Black Girl Gamers and things like that. Um, there's a lot of different um, avenues that a studio can employ uh, to to get their name out there in, in lots of different creative ways. Some may even look on places like GitHub and, and stuff like that or ArtStation to, to find the, the talent that they need. Um, but I suppose the less well-known your name is, the more you might need to employ kind of direct um direct headhunting and then it's about really understanding your audience understanding what candidates what the right candidate uh will see as attractive in your studio and, and making sure that message gets across not only in the initial outreach um but also throughout the the selection process during interviews and things yeah got it i mean the, the companies like startups generally don't have that much of fun so i think these tips might be helpful uh, also you know uh we, like we have seen like like the talent acquisition in, in the talent acquisition space that, you know, it's the most innovative time that we've seen. Uh, so like, what are some things that you've seen or trends or uh, tools that you've seen or use that are most innovative, like for you in like 2024, if you talk about? Hmm, yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's a mix actually. There's, there's, um, there's a lot of tools out there. You know, you've got things like Sourcewell, um, which we use for helping craft email campaigns and um, having those regular touch points. Um, and as I said earlier, you've got things like AI to to tools that help you draft your LinkedIn posts and your in-mails and, and all of those things and, and chat GPT to help you with your searches and stuff like that. And so there's lots of different ways you can be innovative and, and creative. But I think it's important to also still remember some of the more traditional approaches because it is now so easy to create, a, you know, a, an email campaign. Um, I don't know about you, but my my inbox, my personal inbox at the end of the day is is a total mess. I have to spend, you know, 10 to 15 minutes going through and deleting various different offers and stuff. And I probably should unsubscribe to some more stuff, but <laughs> you don't necessarily want to miss out on a, on a good deal and things. I digress. But essentially, you can get so many emails 
um, that your default can become to just delete stuff or pass stuff and, and not really read it properly. Um, and you, you've got, you know, I think it's like three seconds to get someone's attention. And so it can be really important to, to not neglect the old fashioned methods, um, you know, getting out there at industry events, getting out there at conferences, getting to know people um, as well as, and this might be a bit more controversial, but cold calling um, done in the right way, allowing people that time to know, go, no, actually, I can't talk right now. I'm going to hang up. Um, it is still is still a really valuable tool it's a way of breaking through the noise and I think a lot of people are, are either scared to do it or just not used to doing it anymore and so um, you know if, if you employ a few different methods including the the more old-fashioned ones um, you you'll I guess like anything in life that if, if you're more diverse in your approach you'll get a more diverse set of results so um, and and really um, it, when you if you actually want to get to know someone and, and understand what's important to them you have to you have to have a conversation and and sometimes that that can be a number of conversations over a period of time yeah I feel that you know picking up the phone is always better than you know scheduling a, like making them the candidate schedule the call on zoom because it's the rate of someone picking the call is always you know uh, greater than you know someone booking a slot like so I, I feel that you know I'm on board with you know that and that that's really true also, you know, uh, like we're coming to an uh, to our uh, like the end of the podcast. So, as my very last question, like, so what are like your predictions for talent acquisition in twenty twenty five? Like, what are things do you want to see, or you know, like how the work will change? Like, your thoughts on that? Oh, okay. My predictions. I would like to see more um, paid tests for applicants. I would like to see more focus on the candidate experience. Um, I think in games in particular, studios might need to think more about how they're going to show that they are, um, they're secure and they're not about to lay lots of people off. Whether you're an indie or you're a, a larger studio with shareholders, how are you going to rebuild trust um, with, with the industry and, yeah, I, I, you know, I think so. I think studios are going to need to think more about how they show their their stability, stability and security, and and that employees matter, it matter matter to them. But um, I think one of one of the main predictions that that will that I would guess would happen is there's a lot of pent up um, uh, job moves right now. You know, our survey, we run an annual survey every year and um, the the one for 2024 showed, I think it was 70 to 75 percent of people were considering um, a, a job move, whether that was active or passive, um, they would be open to a job move if the right job came up. Um, and there have been a lot of people, particularly in games and the interactive space where they haven't moved because they're too nervous about you know getting laid off in in the often there's that adage of like the the last to join the first to leave and things like that um so there could be not perhaps as extreme as what followed um covid uh, where we had the great resignation but there could be a great resignation too of people who've been holding on and as the market returns to some sense of normality i don't think it's going to be the the mad rush that we saw before but as it returns to some sort of normality there will be more people leaving who perhaps you had no idea were even considering it um who will then need replacing and and so I think studios really need to have a bit of a think about who is it going to be an absolute disaster to replace if they leave what are going to be the most challenging roles to fill what are you doing to um secure your existing talent um and what are you doing to develop the, their replacements or or to think about where you'll find talent externally to to replace them so um those those that I think is is what will happen not necessarily in the first half of 2025 but in the second half I think we'll see as I say a lot of pent-up job moves um happening yeah yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Emily, thank you so much for, you know, uh, being part of the show. It was lovely having you. Thanks. It's been lovely being here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. 